We would go every Saturday morning to synagogue in the middle of the heat Venezuelan hot sun and we would be wearing a suit and we would be wearing a yarmulke walking down the street in Caracas. And I said to my father, why, why are they looking? And he said, oh, because we're special. So unbeknownst to him, he was giving me the tools to say, yes, being an outsider is okay. Welcome to Quiero, a show about Latinx who want it all. I'm your host, Priscilla Garcia Jaque. Today's guest is Moises Kaufman. Moises is the founder and artistic director of Tectonic Theater Project. He's a Tony and Emmy nominated director and playwright, and a 2015 recipient of the National Medal of Arts. I always used to say for years that I came to the States because I wanted to be a theater artist. But the other part of the truth that I don't often tell is that I was 23, I knew that I was gay, and at the time, in 1987, I really didn't think that I could be gay in Venezuela. I didn't think I could be gay, period, mostly. Well, that means that you just didn't see that for yourself. Like, there was no one around you who could tell you that that was okay. There was very little. We didn't have any role models. Um, And, uh, you know... Our countries have a very long tradition of homophobia, of being machista cultures where the definition of masculinity is very small. Mm-hmm. Um, so, the, so I came to New York because I wanted to do theater and I came to New York because I wanted to, and I would have never articulated this this time. way at the time, but I came to find out who I was, mm. uh, sexually, intellectually. You know, the big story is my father was a politician. My mother was a neurologist. Shakira existed, Sofia Vergara existed, Juanes existed. I never thought that I couldn't do it. You know, I always thought, like, clearly Colombians can do everything. But then I got here and it was a slight difference, right? Like, all, all of a sudden I was other, all of a sudden I was whatever. Um, the idea that you could picture your mind in the long run as a theater artist is amazing to me. You already had that I image couldn't. in your head? You no, couldn't? No, I couldn't. No, 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 no. No. You know, Peter Brook... The, the famous theater director, he always says that what he comes into the rehearsal room with is a hunch. He has a hunch, and then he gets together with the actors, and he figures out what the hunch means. And the process of being in the rehearsal room is about uh, unpeeling things so that you can get closer and closer to your hunch. In my life, that has been my experience. Mm-hmm. I had a hunch. I wanted to be in the theater. Everything around me was telling me that because of my accent, because of my immigration status, because of how competitive the theater world is, that I would not succeed. Mm -hmm. And something in me had to say, that may be the case, but this is a worthy pursuit. And the same thing, it's interesting in my life, there's so many things that have prepared me for that journey. As a gay person, everyone around me kept telling me that is immoral, that is perverted, Mm -hmm. that is sick. And there was some part of me that knew that that was not true. And I had to believe with all my might that that was not true in order to survive, because otherwise I would have killed myself. Yeah. And what's interesting is that right before that, my father, we were Orthodox Jews, and my father would take me to synagogue, you know. So imagine this image, my father was 6'2", um, and uh, we would go every Saturday morning to synagogue in the middle of the heat, Venezuelan, you know, hot sun, and we would be wearing a suit, and we would be wearing a yarmulke, walking down the street in Caracas. Because we couldn't drive, right? So we had to walk. So people were always looking at us, right? And I said to my father, why why are they looking? And he said, oh, because we're special. So unbeknownst to him, he was giving me the tools to say, yes, being an outsider is okay. Mm -hmm. I heard you this morning say, my father told me, you know, with his life, he taught me that it was okay to cross oceans and build new lives. I just, it's, that takes my breath away. I mean, that's exactly what we're doing again and again and again. Completely. I knew that it was in my DNA to cross oceans and build new lives because I had seen him do it. You know, he had crossed the ocean after the Holocaust, arrived in Venezuela penniless, started working in the back room of a deli. Was German still his? German and Romanian. He was, his mother was German, his father was Romanian, and he was born in Romania, but his mother tongue was German. Yeah. Okay. And then he got to Venezuela and he was like, let's learn this Venezuelan accent. That's right. Amazing. And he never mastered it. He always spoke yeah. with an accent, just the way I always speak with an accent. Forever. Forever. And, our li- and 
I wear that as a badge of honor. Uh. You know, I think that as, as a species, we're very tribal. Mm -hmm. And we always try to find and surround ourselves with people who share a certain amount of ideology and system of beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, and what I like about my accent is that it reminds people that there's a part of me that never will. And that that is part of who I am. Yeah. And the generation of playwrights right before mine, if you were to ask them, are you a gay playwright, they would get very upset. Mm. I am not a gay playwright. I am a playwright. And when people ask me, are you a gay playwright, I always say, absolutely, I am a gay playwright. Mm. I am also a Latino playwright. I am also a Jewish playwright. I'm also a New Yorker playwright. Mm -hmm. You know, I am a, if I do what I'm doing remotely, correctly, that means I, I'm a playwright of all the things that I am. And the more that as, 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 as a species that is so tribal, we can begin to realize that, that our tribalism is getting in the way of our progress the more the species has more of a chance of surviving. Yeah, you know, as, as a kid, I couldn't be Colombian enough and I was never French enough. I mean, I was never French enough. I'll never be French enough for the French, you know? Mm -hmm. But deciding that the middle ground is where is where you land rather than, you know, and it's like sexuality too. Like if you like boys and girls and it's just like you deal with the middle land, right? If Again, we have a very hard time with duality. And we have a very hard time um, with constructing identities that are complex and relating to identities that are complex. And then you're at NYU and you meet Jeffrey. Yes. And you guys, what was the conversation that made Tectonic? <laughs> I started as an actor and then I, was on, I, was, I would be on stage uh -huh. and like on the fourth year of me being an actor, part of my brain would go out and yes. begin looking at the whole picture. Yes. And so if the play was going a little slow that night, I would speak a little faster to get everybody to go faster. Or if the blocking was a little unclean, I would kind of pace, you know, stand in different places to redesign the composition on stage, which, as you can imagine, garnered me the affection of my fellow actors. Yeah, totally. Like, and probably the... also the director. Yeah. <laughs> you know, was like, Thank you. Actually, Thank the you. the director was terribly fond of me because he felt that I was... Taking uh, care of the play. Taking care of his work. But... Um, so I realized that I was much more interested in creating the entire stage event. So then mm -hmm. when I came to New York, I was directing a lot. And then I finally realized if I really am committed to creating the stage event, I have to tackle the issue of text. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started really writing and creating my own work. How are you directing a lot? Like, what, what does that look like? Because I think, you know, the idea of building your own career isn't sold, and it's a shame. You know, you kind of find out later in life. I was very fortunate because what happened is that at, it, at, at the Experimental Theater Wing, I was creating my own work a lot. I was yeah, uh, writing, I was directing, I was doing all that stuff. And when I was about to graduate, I had a very big fan. The dean of the school, Arthur Barto, was a big fan. He would come to everything I did, was incredibly encouraging. Right. <laughs> like my accent. <laughs> and he, um, so when, when I graduated, I said to him, okay, what do I do now? How do I get a job, right? As a writer, director, as a person who's creating work. He said, well, you're going to have to create your own theater company because nobody's going to hire you. And I said, Arthur, how can you say that? How can you say nobody's going to hire me? You kept saying that you like my work. Yeah. So what made you lose faith in me? He said, it's not that I've lost faith. It's that your project is not about the next play you're directing. Your project is about exploring theatrical language and theatrical form. Nobody's going to pay you to explore that on their dime. Mm -hmm. You have to create a laboratory setting where you can go and do the work that you want to do. Mm -hmm. Best advice anybody ever, ever gave me. And my father had taught me that if you wanted to be your own boss, you had to start your own thing. Yeah. And the first four years of the Tonic Theater Project were incredibly difficult. Mm -hmm. You know, we were the way we would get space is that we would clean, we would offer to clean the basement of a church for a month if they gave us a month of performance. Wow. You know, or and many times for those four years, we had more people on stage than in the audience. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember we once did a, a production of The Nest, mm -hmm. and that's a two-character play, and we had one night where one person came. One person, so there were more people on stage in that two-character play. What a lesson, because that's about, that, that then becomes... Do I like this? Do I like doing this? And is this enough? <laughs> then just like the recognition. You know, theater, art in general, but theater in particular is such an act of faith. Because what you're doing is you're making this mandala, you know, this sand mandala. You know, 
in Tibetan religion, they make they spend months making this mandala made of s colored sand, and then at the end of the of when they finish making it, they reveal it and let the wind blow it away. Yeah. You know, film, the film always stays. Anybody years from now can, you know, download or stream or whatever the film. In theater, you have to be in the room that day. Yeah, and then you're also experiencing it with other people and at the same time. you're experiencing it with other people at the same time, and, it, and it's never the same twice. So it's such an act of faith. Mm -hmm. And also the other thing is that you never know who's out there in the dark. So you never know who's, who's watching it, you never know. So recently I was talking to a writer that I'm beginning to work with, and she said, oh, I saw a play that you did in Chicago. I thought four people saw that play. And she said, and that's when I knew I wanted to be in the theater and I knew what theater could do and blah, 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 blah. And so it really is like building spiritual mandalas that then the wind takes away. And you hope that one of those grains of sand hit somebody at the right moment in their lives and that it did something. Do you think that that understanding has changed throughout the course of your career? Yes, it has deepened mm. greatly. Uh, I am... I am terribly ambitious, and I have a very hard time with the impermanence of my art form. You know, that it's here and then, you know, the play's done. And right, but you've dabbled in film and TV also. I mean, yes. that you have Emmy nominations. It's not like you've just dipped your toe yes. in the water. But, so why, with that feeling, why not pursue, do you know what I mean? Yes, uh, I don't know, because I'm too in love, I guess. Yeah. I do strongly believe that there's nothing quite as that can change a person as theater. Really? I do believe that. That's interesting. On my good days, I believe that. <laughs> and then the next year, like, days, I'm theater like, sucks. I'm an idiot. I know that it would make much more sense to be making film and television, making much more money, and making works that endure in time. And yet but the Larry Project don't. has endured in time. I mean, that's like that's like the play that endures in time constantly. It's you know, it will forever be a conversation. And it will forever be a discovery for the next kid who needs to read that play, right? That play, you can grow up with that play. I tell you one of the things that keeps me in the theater. The, um, the, the, the thing that I am smitten by is the fact that I can capture life in the theater and that, that, and that, that there's a document that exists and then, then other actors have to breathe life into it. So that when you see a production of the Laramie Project that is done in Wichita, that means that there's a group of humans that took that text and spend, you know, two months of their lives delving into the hearts and minds of the people of Laramie, Wyoming. You know, because I come from an Orthodox Jewish background, we believe that the word and that the repetition of certain words and certain sentences create blessings. Right. Right? I, I expand that definition because my theater is not a theater made entirely of words. I try to create stage events that communicate, you know, rituals of deep empathy. Mm -hmm. And so to me, the possibility of creating this text that encapsulate not only words, but ideas and hearts and, and, and experiences, and that, that this things can open experiences for other people, both people witnessing it and people performing it, is alchemical. Do you think you had that thought when you started making theater? Has that no, but I had a hunch. Thing? You had a hunch. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just, I'm just curious, how does your drive match your hunch? I mean, if everything starts with a hunch, it's about uncovering the hunch or is it about goals? The drive is about fleshing out the hunch, always. The drive is always about returning that which is unknown. You know, in religion, people talk a lot about a mystery. And a mystery is not something that, that you don't know. A mystery is something that you perceive but can't articulate. And so that, to me, is a hunch. And I find myself recently using more and more words borrowed from religion and spiritual practices when I talk about theater. So, you know, I, I've been using the word calling a lot, that I have a calling, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and this is going to sound very pompous, but when Moses sees the burning bush, mm -hmm. he is not sure what that means, but he knows that it resonates as something that is truthful, yeah. right? I think that in spiritual traditions, we have more of a lexicon to speak about the creative process than we do in creative traditions. I think, I love that you say that, because I'm finding in my life, so I'm recently sober, 
right? And it's been an experience. It's a journey into like the way that I think, your relationship to God, your relationship to yeah, right. everything in and kind of reworking my relationship to God as I understand it. I realize that I have only ever understood God as a means of the path and the calling. And the more words that I have for it, the stronger everything then becomes. Um, where are you, you used to house people or like hold rehearsal in your home. That was a huge part of the beginning stages of Tectonic. How has that grown and changed? Like, what do you what do you remember of those years, and how do you apply the essence of them still? Today? Well, you know the story. I, I we we started uh, Tectonics rehearsals were happening in a house. We 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 locked out that we had a rent control apartment. It was very very large. It was a classic six in the Upper West Side. But when I say the Upper West Side, the Upper West Side was not back then what it, what it is now. The Upper is West that, Side. That's not the same apartment that you're in today. Yes, we're still in the same apartment. What a love story. Changed. Yes. But so we started rehearsals there, and we would have a dining room and a living room. And so when we would rehearse in the dining room, we had a folding table, mm -hmm. and we'd take the folding table out, mm -hmm. and we would rehearse in the dining room. For years, three or four years we did that. And then when I wrote Gross Indecency, The Three Trials of Oscar Wilde, it was the first time that we had money in the bank because it became a hit, and it ran for two years in New York, and Tectonic had money in the bank. And one day I got home, and my husband had bought this beautiful Haywood Wakefield table real deep wood, heavy, heavy, beautiful table. And I walked in and I said, oh, that's beautiful, but where are we going to rehearse? And he said, exactly. We're not rehearsing in my house anymore. The company has money, rent the rehearsal <laughs> space. But you guys still work together. I mean, that is yes. still the... the we create a tectonic together. It's our you child. Did. We don't have children. We have tectonic. You have tectonic. I am my own wife. Come along. Yeah. This has happened to me repeatedly in my life, right? I started writing a play about Oscar Wilde. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody said, oh, another play about Oscar Wilde. Haven't we had enough of those already? I said, well, I don't know, but I, this is my hunch. And it became a big hit. Then um, as Gross Indecency was in, on, on, in, on stage, um, I, uh, Matthew Shepard was murdered. Mm -hmm. And so we decided to go to Laramie to... Uh, talk to the people of the town and to start the play. And everybody said, oh, really? You're going to do a play about a, a boy that was killed that way? Nobody's going to come to see that. And again, you know, for the past almost two decades now, it's been one of the most performed plays in America. Yeah. Uh, and then Doug Wright called me, and he was thinking about working about on a play about Charlotte von Malstor, who was a uh, 60-some-year-old German transvestite who survived the Nazis and the communists wearing a dress, mm -hmm. is what he, how he describes it. And again, everybody says, oh, a one-man a one show about a, trans, you know, a one transvestite show. That's going to be very, very big, right? Sure enough, we opened off Broadway, and it did become very big, and people really did respond to it, and people were having this experience. So it came time to move it to Broadway, and we were terrified. You know, we have a huge success with this play off Broadway. We can take it to Broadway, and he can die in a week, right. you know? Are we making the right decision? We talked a lot about that. And the final decision came down to, do we believe in the work? And do we believe that this is the kind of work that should be on Broadway? And if that is, the, if that is what's guiding us, then yes, mm -hmm. the risk is worth it because we know why we're there. If we fail and the play doesn't work, then we fail. Mm -hmm. So we did it and we got several Tony nominations and we won the, the Tony for Best Play and Jefferson Mays won the Tony for Best Actor. Uh, and I got a nomination, and so it was, you know, and then that became one of the most performed plays in America. Right. My experience, and this is one of the things that I really rejoice most in saying, is that people are hungry for plays that speak to them intelligently mm -hmm. about things they profoundly care about. Yeah. We go to the theater with a spiritual quest. We just don't know it. And the spiritual quest is that we want to be spoken intelligently about our lives. Like something that I do notice that's happening a lot in my generation, I think that we are hungry to have conversations and yet sometimes forget about the depth that the conversation can actually have. And so we're just saying that we're just happy to have the conversation as just the beginning, but we're not fully going there. And so a lot of work that I see now is actually more just like representations of things rather than the actual thing. Like something that's polemic, I mean, it's such a fine line, right? Because it's a fine line of it's best that it's there than not there. Like, I'd rather have, you know, any Latino on the screen than not, 
you know, but if we're not actually having the conversation or in, engaging in a true experience, then I do feel like it does us a disservice. Let me tell you the way I think about that, okay. about what you're saying. I think that narrative forms in general have this continuum, right? Like, if you go to the Women's March, mm -hmm. right, that's mm -hmm. a form of theater. Mm -hmm. That's a form of dialogue, that's a form of discourse, right? And it's a very important form of discourse, right? But what it does, it doesn't really engage you in a dialogue. It, 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 it gives you a, a, a point of view, it articulates a point of view, it articulates it very loudly, very crisply, very clearly, and, and it creates community within the, all the people that feel a certain way, right? Then on the other hand of the spectrum is Hamlet, right? Because you can say Hamlet is about a dictatorship, right? And how do you oppose a dictatorship? So, you know, the, the spectrum of political discourse is very broad. I am personally more, more interested in that area of narrative work that addresses the individual holistically. You know, if you do a play about DACA, then it's a play about an issue. Yes. So you're going to go talking about what are the merits or pitfalls of this one issue. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in how do you address the humanity of the, the, the person. Because the one thing that narrative arts can do better than political art, in, in, if we make that kind of continuum distinction, is that we can remind people of their humanity. Yes. And by reminding people of their humanity, you're encompassing the whole uh, context of who they are. Yes. And like I'm, I'm fascinated with, you know, Angels in America is coming back on the boards, and I'm very interested to see how that play will work. Because what, what Tony was able to do was that he was able to make a spiritual play about a political issue. I mean, I think it's it, it's like this conversation right now, right? It's saying that in talking about the specifics of our lives, of the way we fall in love and the way that we make art and the way it breaks our heart um, and the way we like our coffee, because we are who we are, then we end up talking about what it means to be Latino, what it means to be gay, you know? But if we just decide we're going to tackle these big issues, then we're not really talking about the issues. Do you see what I mean? Yes, because the problem in America is that we have a great deal of language to talk about political issues, and we don't have the language to talk about either artistic issues or human issues. It is our responsibility as artists to really delve into the niche that we have, which is how do we speak about the complexity of being a human? There was that play that they just did uh, called People, Places, and Things. Oh, it's so good. But the reason why it was, for me, so, so important to play was because, yes, you can say it's an issue, it's a play, it's an issue play about addiction and about rehab. Yes, and mental health and the way that... Right, sure. and, and I never, in watching it, I never felt any of that shit. I felt it was about that person's plight as a human. And I learned more and felt more about all of the addiction issues by watching that, that you know... In our community, there's a, there's so much addiction, and there's so much so many people in rehab, and so many people uh, who are sober. And I am very familiar with that discourse, and with that dialogue, and with that uh, issue. Yeah. I had never understood it as profoundly as I did when watched that play, yeah. and experienced it. So, how do we use what we have? in our toolbox, which is the understanding of the human condition and the understanding of human beings to, to create the kind of world that we envision. I want not just every young creator to hear that, but every, I think the notion is the very, very specific to you is actually what's universal. Yes. The second you take anything and try to make it yeah. universal, you're fucked. Yeah. It's done. You have to speak about the complexity of being a human in the world. And, you know, in my work, I have, I am fascinated with the intersection of real life and art, right? Like, I want to live in that space, whether it's, you know, the life of Oscar Wilde, or whether it's the assassination of Matthew Shepard, or whether it's the life of Charlotte von Malzdorf, or whether it's about a piece of composition of music that Beethoven composed. Like, I'm interested in that space, because then I feel like an archaeologist that I can go into the, the, the thing, the event that happened in life and excavate it for how we translate it into a, a theatrical or an artistic artifact, right? What I have found consistently is that life is such a better dramaturg than mm. we are. You know, when Matthew Shepard was attacked, he, he was taken to the hospital. 
Later that night, uh, the, the, the boy who attacked Matthew got in a fight, and he ended up in the hospital. He was in the room next door to Matthew Shepard, and the same doctor was, look, was treating both Matthew Shepard in one room and going to the other room to treat Matthew's perpetrator, Matthew's attacker. They were in rooms next to one another. The doctor was dealing with one body and with the other body next to one another. As a playwright, if I had written that scene fictionally, everybody would roll their eyes. Yeah. Oh, come on. Of course, yeah. So too heavy. The metaphor is too heavy. But when you, when you deal with real life, you can do that because it's what happened. Yes. So, you know, how do you create theatrical artifacts? How do you create plays yes. that are so human that they transcend the, any one issue? You can say that Angels in America is about AIDS. But Angels in America is about migration. You know, Angels in America is about, you know, our prophetic selves. Angels in America is about finding that space in our hearts that is not rid riddled with disease. Yeah. It's about, so anyway, so, I, so the reason why I am so attracted to life is because that's where I find the complexity to write about the human condition. What's been the hardest part? Failure. Mm -hmm. Failure is always the hardest part, right? But what is failure? What is failure in your life? Failure is when you work on a, 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 a play or a film or an episode of a, of a TV series and the result doesn't match your hunch. That's failure. Um, you know, and it's heartbreaking, and it's uh, it makes you feel terribly naked, and uh, you know, I think that the, the one thing that that I've learned is that the pits of despair feel never ending and feel painful enough that you want to quit. You know, we always want to create the narrative of, of the victor of the victor, right? We always want to create the narrative of one who is victorious. But I think that it does everyone a disservice to speak of the victories without speaking of the perils and the uncertainty. We just finished our Tectonic Theater Project book, yeah. our Moment Workbook. And I was, and I read it, and I was so excited by it, and I thought, okay, now I have to write a, an epilogue. And the epilogue was all about, wait a minute, we got everything wrong in this book. Because this book feels like we went from success to success to success to success. And the reason why it reads that way is because we were trying to tell you the things that worked. And not to focus on the things that worked so that you, the reader, could take something away that's helpful to you. But I would be making a great, great mistake if I didn't say that we could write another entire book or three books about all the things that went wrong mm -hmm. and all of the moments of great uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's very romantic now to turn around and say, oh, there were many times more actors on stage than people sure. in the audience. But at the time, it's not what it feels at the, like. At the times, it felt like a huge failure. And at the time, it felt like, let's quit. And at the time, it, it, and the other word that people don't use a lot is embarrassment. When you're doing a play and there's three people in the audience, you feel embarrassed. And so this idea of like how awful it is, like how often you're going to feel embarrassed and how you have to make friends with embarrassment and fear and, and discomfort and, you know. It's an ugly emotion. I think that the, our private moments are really hard to talk about, right. you know. Right. Um, this year was the first year. I turned 26 in December. And it was the first year that I had panicked about my age. <laughs> Um, I was having a hard time with the idea that I was turning yes. 26. Somehow, you know, like little ambitious Priscilla, I wasn't exactly where I wanted to be at 26. And I was telling a friend this. I was like, I'm not exactly where I want to be. And she was like, well, yeah, but who is? And I thought, I looked at her and I sincerely thought, I really thought I would be, you know? And it was the first time that I felt a little bit of that feeling. Like, I'm embarrassed. Like, I think this is what this feeling is, embarrassment. It's not a nice feeling to feel in the open. And, you know, it's interesting, right? Because, like, I never knew that you were 26. I thought in my mind, because you're so mature that you were much older. Mm -hmm. And, like, I'm like, you're 26 and you have achieved all of this? And you are doing all of this? And I have witnessed you 
work with brilliant humans and and I am in awe of what you have achieved. But that is a testament to the fact that other people's perception of who we are in the work will never match our own. So the big the biggest problem is how do we come to terms with our own perception of our work and who we are and how do we negotiate a truce? Because I have always been worried that if that didn't exist, I would lose 90% of what fuels me. That those horrible feelings of fears and failure is what gets me up the next morning to keep mm -hmm. fighting, right? And so I had a shrink once who said to me, yes, that's true, that's your fuel. Can we find a healthier fuel? Yes, I mean... And I know that's a correct question. I haven't found it, I'm 54. Yeah. Um, what is the next step? I'm in an interesting moment in my life where um, I feel like Tectonic and I are in a spot that, that feels like a, a jumping board. Mm -hmm. Like a, I, I really, f I've become more ambitious in this moment in my life. I want Tectonic to do bigger works. I want Tectonic to be more visible. I want our work to be more epic. I want our work to be more present in the social dialogue. I want to use, you know, we have killed ourselves for 25 years to have this theater company be where it is. We're in a position now that I want to take to the next level. So I've been thinking longer term now. It's funny, you know, I'm 54 and I'm thinking longer term. Like what is, what do the new next 25 years look like? And what does the work look like? And I just, I'm really invested now in using the power that we have gathered to keep building. Mm -hmm. That's a really beautiful way to also frame your getting the National Medal for the Arts, that that could be your jumping board for the yes. next yes. chapter. Yes. I just am curious about, are you a citizen yes, now? You are a citizen now, which is like that conversation. I mean, it's saying like, I'm an immigrant and you've done this great thing for this country, right? Well, like, what I, is that like? They were writing a book about immigrants and they, they wrote this interesting book about immigrants in six words, that each immigrant would have to tell their story in six words. And I wrote, Immigrant National Medal of Arts recipient. Right? Uh, and uh, when I gave the commencement speech at the Tisch School of the Arts for, at NYU, I said, you know, I have Tony nominations, I have Emmy nominations, I got the National Medal of the Arts from President Barack Obama. Uh, this is what immigrants do. You know, and uh, so that that is, is important, but also this sense of how do I own that, yes. right? How do I own that? How do I take the National Medal of Arts and experience it and be present for it and live it? We are taught to keep working, get back into the rehearsal room, do the work, do the work, do the work, do the work. But I hope that the people who are watching this, especially the people who are trying to make a world for themselves, hear that and say, I have to be present for every one of my achievements. I always used to say that there were two kinds of coaches. There's the coach that like yells at you and is like, you fucking suck, get out there, try harder. And then there's the coach that's like, you're worth getting better, just mm -hmm. try again. And I have found, as you so beautifully just stated, that the latter is what's sustainable for the rest of our lives. Completely. And so if I am happy about the way... This interview went. Yeah. Or this rehearsal went. Yeah, then that's actually practice for the bigger moment. That's right. Um, Moises, I could keep talking to you forever. <laughs> um, I love you and I, I just, I can't quite express the impact that you've had on my life. I mean, I think, I, I think you know that, um, but watching you has always, I mean, forever, right? Since I first got here myself, um, you've just been really important in my own development and shaping of me as a thinker and an artist. So thank you. <laughs> I'm very, very honored to be here with you. And I am, do you know what the word nachas means? No. Nachas is a wonderful Yiddish word. It means pride for someone else. You usually do it for your children. Oh, my children are giving me so much nachas. So you're giving me so much nachas. I love you. <laughs>